Domineering, complaining, demanding wives who had just about psychologically castrated their husbands were responsible for the early rush. These wives were so disagreeable and had made their men so tense that they were robbed of the satisfaction of being men. To escape this tension and the chance of being ridiculed by his own wife, each of these men had gotten up early to come to a prostitute. Warning, viewer discretion is advised. The content, views, and educational material you are about to experience could challenge your belief, trigger strong emotions, and frankly, piss you off. This isn't for everyone. If you're not ready to confront new ideas, or if your feelings bruise easily, this might be the time to click away. Expect to be challenged, to think, and you might even want to scream at the screen. Proceed with caution, and remember, you chose to be here. Let's get it. Salam alaikum, peace. I'm Coach Nadir one of the founders of Outstanding Personal Relationships, as well as one of the authors of the book, Let's Talk Polygamy Uncensored. So, what I think is fitting for the series that answers the question, why men want to marry multiple wives, is listening to a, a small bit from the autobiography of Malcolm X that is read by Lawrence Fishburne, which is pretty dope. Many of you probably know him from The Matrix as Morpheus, our Neo's mentor, if you will. But he really talks deeply about a couple of different things, the things that he learned from women. And I'm not going to steal the shine, but I just want you to pay attention because a wise woman is going to take notes, be objective and evaluate herself and see if what she's doing or not doing is leading her husband to desire or increase that desire. Since it's already in him, I believe men are polygynous by nature anyway to marry multiple women. I was one of the very few males in this rooming house. This was during the war when you couldn't turn on the radio and not hear about Guadalcanal or North Africa. In several of the apartments, the women tenants were prostitutes. The minority were in some other racket or hustle. Boosters, numbers runners, or dope peddlers, and I guess that everyone who lived in the house used dope of some kind. This shouldn't reflect too badly on that particular building because almost everyone in Harlem needed some kind of hustle to survive and needed to stay high in some way to forget what they had to do to survive. It was in this house that I learned more about women than I ever did in any other single place. It was these working prostitutes who schooled me to things that every wife and every husband should know. Later on, it was chiefly the women who weren't prostitutes who taught me to be very distrustful of most women. There seemed to be a higher code of ethics and sisterliness among these prostitutes than among numerous ladies of the church who have more men for kicks than the prostitutes have for pay. Wow. And I am talking about both black and white. Many of the black ones in those wartime days were right in step with the white ones and having husbands fighting overseas while they were laying up with other men even giving them their husband's money. And many women just faked as mothers and wives while playing the field as hard as prostitutes with their husbands and children right there in New York. I got my first schooling about the cesspool morals of the white man from the best possible source, from his own women. And then as I got deeper into my own life of evil, I saw the white man's morals with my own eyes. I even made my living helping to guide him to the sick things he wanted. I was young, working in the bar, not bothering with these women. Probably I touched their kid brother instinct, something like that. Some would drop into my room when they weren't busy and we would smoke reefers and talk. It generally would be after their morning rush, but let me tell you about that rush. Seeing the hallways and stairs busy any hour of the night with white and black men coming and going was no more than one would expect when one lived in a building out of which prostitutes were working. But what astonished me was the full house crowd that rushed in between, say, 6 and 7.30 in the morning, then rushed away, and by about 9, I would be the only man in the house. It was husbands who had left home in time to stop by this St. Nicholas Avenue house before they went on to work. Of course, not the same ones every day, but always enough of them to make up the rush. And it included white men who had come in cabs all the way up from downtown. Domineering, complaining, demanding wives who had just about psychologically castrated their husbands were responsible for the early rush. These wives were so disagreeable and had made their men so tense that they were robbed of the satisfaction of being men. To escape this tension and the chance of being ridiculed by his own wife, each of these men had gotten up early to come to a prostitute. The prostitutes had to make it their business to be students of men. They said that after most men passed their virile 20s, they went to bed mainly to satisfy their egos. And because a lot of women don't understand it that way, they damage and wreck a man's ego. No matter how little virility a man has to offer, prostitutes make him feel for a time that he is the greatest man in the world. That's why these prostitutes had that morning rush of business. More wives could keep their husbands if they realized their greatest urge is to be men. Those women would tell me anything. Funny little stories about the bedroom differences they saw between white and black men. The perversities. I thought I had heard the whole range of perversities until I later became a steerer, taking white men to what they wanted. The prostitute said that most men needed to know what the pimps knew. A woman should occasionally be babied enough to show her the man had affection, but beyond that, she should be treated firmly. These tough women said that it worked with them. 
All women by their nature are fragile and weak. They are attracted to the male in whom they see strength. All right. So take it for what you will. But that's Malcolm or a clip from his autobiography read by Lawrence Fishburne on Audible at one and a half speed. I don't listen to anything at just one speed. It's, it's a little tedious on me, but listening to it at one and a half speed is what I do. But what nuggets did you get from what he shared, from what he learned about women from other women? Mm. Sounds like some of the stuff that uh, Kevin Samuels and other male relationship individuals talk about online to this day with modern women. So I'm not going to add my extra commentary. I just wanted to share with you what Malcolm wrote in his autobiography. And if you are, if you have not read it, it's an absolute masterpiece. And one of the books that I read when I was searching and studying and looking for a life with purpose, if you will. With that being said, prayerfully, you took some good notes. You got some good stuff. What I want you to do is post in the comments. You made it to the end of this video. Post in the comments the autobiography of Malcolm X. Just, just the title, the autobiography of Malcolm X. Let me know that you support us in what we're doing by posting that down. I will greatly appreciate it. I'm Coach Now there to help people get their shift together. So remember, wish changes nothing but a decision changes everything. So be outstanding. Make sure you subscribe. Hit that bell. You're on our email list at outstandingpersonalrelationships.com. I will see you in the next one. Asalaamu Alaikum. Peace.